How many of you have ever heard the term, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired? Well, if you're familiar with that term, there's a woman, a strong black woman that you can thank for that. Now, I'm not saying she originated the term, but she has become famous for the term, and her name is Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer is a civil rights icon who was quoted as making this bold statement as she was speaking to a judge, this woman who had been through so much, and this woman who was not only a woman, but she was a black woman, which means she was a double minority in a country that had no appreciation for her, a country who did not care about her, a country who treated her in any kind of way, a country who considered her three-fifths human, a country who violated her rights, not just her rights, but civil rights. We could not even be civil. And this woman says to this judge, sir, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. If we were to read this text in, in the contemporary context, I believe that this woman said to herself in this text, I've been bleeding for 12 years and I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. If I were to give today's sermon title, it would be this. And again, go ahead and Put your holy hat on, because I don't want you to go back. Uh, I would call this sermon when a woman's fed up. I know some of you just heard the bass line to that R. Kelly song, but it's all right. Just <laughs> snatch your mind back in Jesus' name and say with me, when a woman's fed up. When a woman's fed up, according to Robert Kelly, ain't nothing you can do about it. And this woman gets fed up. And I'm crazy enough to believe that when this woman got fed up, there was nothing the devil could do about it when a woman's fed up. I want to share with you today three ways that we go from bleeding to blessing. I want you to write that down in your notes. How do I get from bleeding to blessing? Have you ever bled before? Most of us don't have the testimony of bleeding for 12 years. This woman is the only one that I know who can say, I have bled not for 12 seconds, not for 12 minutes, not for 12 days, not for 12 months. But 12 long years. Now, in order to deal with uh, how we get from bleeding to blessing, I think the first thing we actually need to do is deal with why this woman is bleeding. Oftentimes we read this text and we, we, we highlight the fact that this woman is bleeding, but, but has anyone ever told you why this woman is bleeding? I think if we examine why this woman is bleeding, we have an opportunity to put ourselves in her shoes. And that's something that we don't like to do too often. We read the Bible from a lens of ourselves when the Bible invites us to see ourselves in the people that we're reading about. And I would argue that the reason we don't like to put ourselves in their shoes is because we know where they're going and we don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. This woman has been bleeding for 12 years and we brothers say, I cannot identify with this woman at all. But I would argue that even though you are not bleeding menstrually, many of you are bleeding financially. Mm -hmm. You may not be bleeding yeah, menstrually, yeah. but some of you are bleeding emotionally. You may not be bleeding menstrually, but some of you are bleeding mentally. You may not be bleeding menstrually, but how many of us are bleeding emotionally? Yeah. This woman is bleeding, but why is she bleeding? Well, I just told you this woman has a menstrual bleeding. Now, every woman in here can testify to what it is to bleed menstrually. This is a very annoying thing. I, I, I bless God for you, sisters, and, and I am a man who, who proudly goes to Walmart to get my wife her feminine products because I would not want to walk a day in those shoes. I, I can't imagine if I started bleeding in that area. I would not be able to contain myself, and so I, I am that husband that walks to that aisle on Walmart or Target or wherever I have to get them from, and I lift it in the air as I walk to the aisle to check out because I want them to know ain't no shame in my game. I, I, I got a strong black woman at home who is dealing with this thing uh, and I need her to be happy. And, and so this woman is bleeding menstrually. Now, there's nothing wrong with bleeding menstrually. In fact, if you're bleeding menstrually, that's a sign that your body is doing what it's designed to do. I did some research because clearly I forgot everything they taught me in health class, and I started reading up on why do women go through menstrual cycles. And I discovered that the, the, the main priority reason that women go through menstrual cycles is to prepare the body for pregnancy. In other words, 
uh, you are bleeding because your body is preparing you to produce something. Please don't miss that. You are bleeding because your body is preparing you to produce something. That 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 struck me as I read that. I'm like, wow, that is powerful. This 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 annoying thing that my wife is going through is 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 not just a burden, but really there are benefits to her bleeding. There's there's something at work inside of her. I, I began to read a little further, and what I discovered is that the reason that they are bleeding is because in this preparation of menstruation, which then leads to ovulation, uh, what happens is there's a lining that begins to get built up in the uterus. And, and, and it's, it's this thick lining is being prepared for the egg to drop during the ovulation process. Now, what happens is that if you do not fertilize that egg within a certain amount of time, your hormone levels begin to drop and that lining begins to disintegrate and that egg begins to dissolve. And so what you're bleeding, you're bleeding out what did not produce. She's bleeding because her body is actually working normally. That it's getting rid of what did not produce so that it can begin a new cycle for something that will produce. And some of you can look back over your lives, and I know you hate to think about those bloody places in your life, but I came to tell you on this morning that the bleeding was necessary. That, that you had to bleed in that old relationship to make room for the new relationship. You, you had to bleed in that old place of employment to make room for the, the new opportunity that God wanted. But you, you had to bleed out some old stuff that won't produce it. Because God wanted to make room for something that will actually produce. Now, we understand why she's bleeding, but, but again, it doesn't sound like we've really hit the problem yet. Because the problem is not that she's bleeding. The problem is that she cannot stop bleeding. See, again, bleeding has benefits. Bleeding can be a blessing. Bleeding in itself is not wrong. The problem is when you cannot stop bleeding. Now, why can't she stop bleeding? These are the things we don't think about when we preach. We just like to get happy in the fact that she pressed through the crowd and she touched him of his garment, but we never deal with how she got there. She can't stop bleeding because her body has malfunction. In other words, what was designed to help her is now hurting her. What was designed to help her body produce is now hindering her body from producing. And I would argue that nothing hurts worse than being hurt by what was designed to help you. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> it, 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 it hits a little different mm. when the one I love does something to hurt me. Mm. Hits a little different when the people I trusted betrayed me. It, it hits a little different when the people I worship with go to war with me. <laughs> Maybe this is why they call it Church hurt. Mm. I examined this thing. I thought about it because I used to be in that argument that said, ain't no, ain't no such thing as church hurt. Hurt is just hurt. Hurt hurts wherever you get hurt. And we like to make that argument, but what I think about it, if the church is the body of Christ, and the Bible tells, that, uh, tells us husbands that we are to love uh, our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, mm -hmm. then should church hurt? And I would argue that even if church does hurt, the same place that hurt me should have the power to heal me. And maybe the problem is I'm getting hurt in churches that have no power to heal. Because sometimes you do have to break a bone. But what you do after you break it? This woman has been hurt by what should have helped her. She's been hindered by what should have Helped her, and now she's continually bleeding, and she's bleeding because her body has malfunctioned. But not only has her body malfunctioned, no one knows what to do with the malfunction. So she's bleeding, but she doesn't know why. And I would argue that there are some of you sitting in your seats right now, some of you who are watching this right now, you're still bleeding, and the only reason you're bleeding is because you don't know what went wrong. The Bible says she goes to every doctor and they can't figure it out. She goes to the priest and the priest can't figure it out. She goes to her family, friends, they can't figure it out. And so a part of her bleeding is wrestling with why. 
And this is the danger. This, this is what keeps us bleeding. See, again, there's nothing wrong with bleeding. Bleeding can be beneficial. The problem is when I can't stop bleeding, and there's some of us who are bleeding on people we love, some of us that are bleeding in our offices, some of us who are bleeding over the dreams that God has given us, some of us, I hate to say, are bleeding on our congregations because we're wrestling with what went wrong. Yeah, yeah. What do I mean? If... If my enemy knocks me down, I can get up because I know why he knocked me down. You don't like me. If my enemy talks about me, I can, I can get over that because I understand why my name is in your mouth. You don't like me. But when my friend knocks me down, I tend to sit there for a little bit because I'm wrestling with what went wrong. When the person I trusted with my secret starts telling my secrets to other people, it's, it's hard to get over that. Because I'm trying to reconcile what went wrong. Some of us are bleeding because daddy left and we don't know why. Some of us are bleeding because the one we said I do to said I don't to us and we don't know why. Some of us are bleeding because they told me that they could they could deliver me, but I got there and I'm more bound than I've ever been. We're bleeding wow. because we did the right things, but the wrong things kept happening. We just don't know why. And maybe now that we understand why this woman is bleeding, maybe we can get from bleeding to blessing. How do we get from bleeding to blessing? Can I give you a couple of points? How do we get from bleeding to blessing? Because... Some of you look real holy today, but if the truth be told, you're bleeding. Some of you look really nice, and, and we have this habit of dressing up our bleeding. We, watch this. We, we develop pads to cover our bleeding. We, 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 we pad our bleeding with, with praise and worship. We pad our bleeding with, with working overtime at the office. We pad our bleeding by preaching with fervor sometimes. We pad our bleeding and all that. How do we get from bleeding to blessing? That's what happens to the sister in this text. And now that I've laid a framework, I pray that we can walk ourselves out of this thing. Three ways to go from bleeding to blessing. Can I give you the first one? Yeah. How do we go from bleeding to blessing? We go from bleeding to blessing by, as the name of this sermon tells us, we must get fed up. We must get fed up. We must get fed up. Uh, the text says, Jesus went with the man. And a huge crowd followed Jesus and pressed him on every side. And the crowd was a woman who had been suffering. Somebody say suffering. suffering. From not just any bleeding, the Bible says chronic bleeding, for 12 years. And although she had been under the care of many doctors and had spent all her money, she had not been helped at all. Actually, she had become worse. You must Get fed up. In the words of Fanny Lou Hamer, you must get sick and tired of being sick and tired. If you want to stop bleeding, you have to get fed up. Now, why is this woman fed up? In fact, how do I even know that this woman is fed up? I would argue that this woman got fed up because she decided to break the rules. She decided to break the rules. Some of you don't see that because you don't you don't like to read your Bibles, but it's okay. I'm gonna help you out. Uh, the reason this woman is living in the condition she's living in is because if you go to the Old Testament, if you go to Leviticus, it says that if a woman has a menstrual bleeding that goes beyond her normal period, that such a woman has to be isolated. We call it in pandem uh, pandemic times quarantine because for the good of everyone else, we don't want this thing to spread. And so if her menstrual bleeding goes beyond the time of her menstrual cycle, then she is to say to herself, her children can't be around her, her family can't be around her, her friends can't be around her, she can't come to the worship experience on Sunday morning, she can't go to food lines, she can't do this, she can't do that. She has to be isolated. And she cannot come out of isolation until her menstrual uh, bleeding finally ends. But even after the menstrual bleeding is over, she has to then give herself seven more days to make sure that it doesn't come back. Then she has to be inspected by the priest. And after she's inspected by the priest, then she has to give an offering for her deliverance. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says this is how we deal with your bleeding. 
She's been dealing with this for 12 years. Though. What do you do when the Bible has nothing to say about what you're going through? Or better yet, what do you do when the Bible tells you what to do about your issue, but it don't solve your issue? And this is her dilemma. Because she goes to the priest, and the priest says, the Bible says. And he sends her back home. And then she comes to the priest again, and he says, the Bible says. And she goes back home. I would argue, like one of my favorite pastors, Pastor Howard John Wesley, that some of the most dangerous words in human history are the Bible says. Because some of us say the Bible says not to help people, but to keep people back. They keep telling her the Bible says because they don't know how to solve her issue. And I'm sick of folks screaming the Bible says, not because the Bible says it, but because you don't have a resolution for my problem. The priest just keeps telling her the Bible says. And so she goes to the doctors, and the doctors tell her what the medical book says. And they keep telling her the medical book says, watch this, until she runs out of money. Until her insurance won't cover it anymore. So she just gets tired of getting up and going to Until they will no longer fill her prescription. They say, the Bible says, in the church, and then the culture tells her the medical book says. And so the rules are not in her favor. The rules have now become the problem. And when we get to a place where the rules are the problem, we have to re-examine the rules. When there are things in our churches that are keeping people down, we have to re-examine those traditions. Yeah. Pastor Mike ain't coming here flipping over tables and chairs just because I came flipping tables and chairs because I was tired of seeing people bound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was the day. Oh my God. When we never stop to ask why, we get stuck in the what. And many of us are stuck in a what that is older than us because we never ask why. So she wakes up. And she says, you know what? I did everything the preacher told me to do. I did everything the doctor told me to do. And not only am I not better, I'm worse. And the reason she's worse, I did a little homework, the reason she's worse is because during the New Testament times, they would go from doctor to doctor, and the problem is the doctor, this doctor wouldn't communicate with that doctor, and that doctor wouldn't communicate with this doctor, and they would try all these things on them, and the problem is what you try to help me with here is not is, is, is conflicting with what they're trying to help me with here, and so they would mix all this stuff together, and what you were calling medicine became my poison. We got to be careful who's filling our prescriptions. See, see, we, I'll say it this way. We got to be careful who gets in our ear. Because watch this. This person meant well. And this person meant well. And this person meant well. But the problem is, all of their well-meaning, if, if, if I don't have a way to filter that thing out, can now start destroying me. She says, listen, I've been playing by the rules, but by playing by the rules, I'm worse off than I was before. So she wakes up this morning and decides, I'm sick of playing by the rules. Because playing by the rules are keeping me stuck in a place that I don't want to be. If I were to give the word fed up a definition, it would be this next thought. Fed up is becoming unapologetic about no longer accepting what is unacceptable. Y'all ain't responding like I'm preaching. Yes. Fed up is becoming unapologetic about no longer accepting what is unacceptable. Now, the reason you're not throwing furniture right now is because you don't know what I mean by that. Let's see if I can make it plain. Shameless plug for my new episode three coming. Let me see if I can make it plain. Um, have you ever been to a store that has a sign on their register that says, we do not accept credit or debit payments less than $5? 
If you ever seen that before, yeah. Yeah. you will see that never at a high-end place. You'll always see that in a small business. <laughs> and the reason you'll see that in a small business, and that's no shade to a small business, but the reason you'll see that in a small business is because there are transaction fees for using a debit or credit card machine. Okay. Now, the problem is some small businesses don't make enough business to cover those transaction fees. And so they will put a sign out that says, listen, it is our policy that we do not take a credit card or debit payments less than $5 because it may be convenient for you, but it's costly to me. I'm going to say that again. It may be convenient for you, but it is costly for me. And some of you are still bleeding because it's convenient for other people, but it's costly to you. Can I go a little deeper? Yeah. I'll go a little deeper. There was this store who, when they started out, they were taking credit and debit card payments. They didn't care how much money you spent. They would take your credit card or debit card payment. Well, one day as they started going over their numbers, they came to the realization that this is not sustainable. I cannot do this anymore. It is going to run me out of business if I keep doing this. And so they made a policy change. Uh, they placed one of those signs that we don't like to see because then we came in there for bubble gum, but now we got to get a soft drink. We got to get a bag of chips. We got to get all this stuff because uh, 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 it's too costly for them. Uh, so now it's not convenient. So they changed their policy. And after they changed their policy, their customers started complaining because they said, you used to do this. You, you used to process it no matter when. But, but, but the store told them, listen, I know we used to do that. I, I know you're used to the way we used to do things. Uh, but again, that's convenient for you, but it's too costly for us. And there's some of you that got to have some conversations with some people in your life. You got to let them know there is a policy change. Uh, uh, I know I used to accept that from you, but I no longer accept that from you. I, I, I know doing that at the church used to be acceptable, but that ain't acceptable no more. I, I know doing this in the workplace used to be acceptable, but I ain't accepting that no more. Uh, the store owner let them know, listen, I know you're used to me accepting this thing. But I've made up in my mind that from this day forward, I will never accept it again. I will not accept your disrespect. I will not accept you putting my name in your mouth. I will not accept you treating me any kind of way. I will not accept you taking my money and not paying me back. I will not accept it anymore. What I used to accept is now unacceptable, and I am unapologetic about it. Amen. And if that means I no longer play the game by your rules, then baby, I just ain't playing them by your rules. Yes, sir. I'm making my own. And this woman decides that since the rules are not working for me, I'm just going to make my own rules. I know the Bible says that anything I touch will become unclean, but baby, you just going to have to be unclean today because I am not accepting this anymore. I, I, I know you don't like having me around because I embarrass you. I know you don't like me being around because it grosses you out. I know you don't like having me around because I'm too much for you and I do the most sometimes. But baby, playing by the rules ain't working for me, so I'm making my own. What I used to accept is unacceptable. Yeah. And some of us have to get fed up into the place that what we used to accept, we are not accepting anymore. Because it's convenient for you. But it's costing me way too much. And this woman decides that, listen, me being isolated is convenient for you. Watch this, because you don't have to deal with my issue. Ah, uh, me being isolated is convenient for you, because uh, now you got something to talk about. Uh, me being isolated is convenient for you, because now you don't have to try to figure out how to deal with me. But somebody say, I'm coming out. I'm coming out. And I want the world to know. Bring your thoughts back. Bring your thoughts back. Cannot be a second or something. She comes out, even though the whole world told her to stay in. Because it was convenient for them, but it was costing her way too much. Somebody's phone's a little too close to that mic receptor. Thank you. Um, we gotta get fed up. We gotta get fed up. We're gonna go from leading to blessing. We have to get to a place where we are unapologetic and choose to no longer accept uh, those things that are unacceptable. And this is the first step she takes. She decides when she wakes up that morning. 
I am not accepting this anymore. And I don't know what you've been accepting. I don't know who I'm preaching to in this moment, but I don't know what you've been accepting. But you have to get to the place where you decide it is unacceptable. I don't care how inconvenient it is for you. I don't care how much it costs you. I don't care how far you got to go for it. I don't care how uncomfortable it may make other people know this is a season where you got to deal, you got to work and deal on you. In spite of what they say, in spite of what they do, in spite of what they feel about it, it is unacceptable. And you are no longer going to have to accept it. We must get fed up. Not only must we get fed up, but we must get our fight up. We must get fed up, and we must get our fight up. Somebody say, I got to get my fight up. What do I mean? Verse 27, it says, uh, since she had heard about Jesus, she came from behind in the crowd and touched his clothes. Now, now that doesn't really sound too intense, um, but if you read a little further up, this crowd is described a certain way. This is not just a regular crowd. The Bible says, uh, if you go to the King James, that this crowd surrounded Jesus and thronged him. Somebody say it, thronged him. Thronged. Can I teach you a little bit? That word throng actually means to choke or to suffocate. Mm -hmm. So this crowd is choking My and God. suffocating. My God. So this woman goes to the crowd. Mm -hmm. She goes to this crowd that is choking suffocate. Why does she do this? Because she finally made sense of her situation. Mm -hmm. See, I've been fighting this thing for a long time, but I'm not getting anywhere in this fight. I've been fighting the bleeding, but I have not fought what's been allowing the bleeding to happen. Mm -hmm. And so she goes to the crowd because the crowd is symbolic of a system. Mm -hmm. And she decides to take on a system that is suffocating. She says, fighting this way didn't work, so now I got to change my fight up. We must get our fight up. So this woman, she decides, listen, I'm tired of fighting the bleeding in isolation. I'm going to go to the thing that allows the bleeding to keep happening. Now, what do I mean, uh, the thing that allows the bleeding to keep happening? I just told you that she went to every doctor that she could find. And no matter what doctor she went to, they all just kept telling her what the medical book says, what the medical book says, what the medical book says. Until finally she ran out of money. I would argue there's something wrong with a health care system mm. yeah. that's not interested in healing me. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's something very unusual about a system that profits off of my sickness. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm the minority. But, 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 but I don't think my level of treatment should be dependent upon how much insurance I have. Amen. And I know y'all saying, Pastor Mike, you shouldn't get all political in the pulpit. But I'm just talking about a broken system. And this is not the only broken system that the sister has to deal with. Because that's the, the, the healthcare broken system. But there's also a religious broken system that she has to deal with. See, I think there's something wrong with a church that tells me the Bible says. But then after they tell me the Bible says, there's no plan on what we're going to do with the fact that I'm still here. See, you can tell me the Bible says all day, but the Bible says it this way. Faith, if it has no works, is dead. And so I know the Bible says I shouldn't be here, but I'm here. Right. Now what are we going to do about it? There's a broken health care system, but there's also a broken religious system. That she's going to the priest, and they keep telling her the Bible says, but none of them are interceding for her. Because maybe we don't like intercession because it's bloody. Mm. Maybe we don't like intercession because we don't want to get our garments messed up. Maybe we don't like true intercession because it might cost us our reputation. Why is that priest spending so much time with that bloody female? What is going on with this priest that he feels comfortable being around this defiled woman? Why would this priest spend so much time with this homosexual brother or sister? Why is that priest hanging out with people who still smoke weed? Why is that priest spending so much time with people who are drunkards? Why is this priest spending so much time with those who are addicted? Why is this priest spending time with someone who's a sex addict? Is he a sex addict? Are they getting it on? What's going on with the priest? Maybe we don't intercede like we should. Because our system is broken. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's something wrong with the religious system that tells me the Bible says, 
And that's it. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe everything the Bible says, but I believe that my God is bigger than this Bible. Amen. That's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother time. A whole nother sermon for a whole nother time. We have to get our fight up. But might I argue that not only is there a broken healthcare system, not only is there a broken religious system, but, but I would argue that our families can be broken systems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 our families can be broken systems. What do I mean? I, I think there's something wrong with a family that you tell them you've been molested and their response is what happens in this house stays in this house. I think there's something wrong with a, a familial system uh, that says, listen, uh, 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 this ain't really they daddy, but we ain't going to tell them. We, we just going to let this thing go over it and just let them think that this is their source. Now, there's something in them that's telling them that there's something different here. So now you're leaving me to wrestle with something that if we just had a conversation about, I wouldn't have to wrestle. You got me in counseling over something that we could just have a conversation about. I, I, my marriage is messed up because I'm wrestling with something we could have a conversation. There's something wrong with the family system that leaves us in bondage. What's interesting is this woman's cycle has become a cycle. Her bondage has become bondage. Her, again, I'm saying again, her cycle has become a cycle. See, this should have happened monthly, but this thing that should have happened monthly now happens yearly. And that's the problem. See, there are some cycles in our lives that are normal. But what makes them abnormal is when those cycles themselves become cycles within cycles. I know that's a lot for your brain to process, but many of us are, are, are in a situation or in a season where we have found ourselves in a cycle of a cycle. And that's where she is. And so she changes her fight. She says, you know what? I'm done fighting this thing in isolation. Because fighting it in isolation isn't getting me anywhere. I'm going to the thing that allows my bleeding to continue. See if I can make this point. Um, there was this woman who went to her doctor. She said, Doc, I, I, I have these crazy headaches and I'm feeling dizzy all the time. And he prescribes some medicine to her. She takes the medicine, but she's still feeling that way. She comes back to the doctor. She says, Doctor, I, the medicine you gave me was good, but, but I'm still feeling the dizziness and I'm, I'm still having crazy headaches. And so he prescribes her something else. And so she comes back to the doctor. She says, doctor, uh, I, you gave me the stronger medicine, but, but I said, I'm still getting crazy headaches, and I'm, I'm, I'm still feeling dizzy. And finally, the doctor says, when do you feel this the worst? And she says, I feel it the worst when I'm at home. He paused. He says, so wait a minute. When you leave the house, it gets better. But when you go to the house, it gets worse. She says, you know what? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. He says, um, sis, uh, you don't need another prescription. Either you need an evacuation or you need a demolition. There is something in your house that is making you sick. And I can keep dealing with the symptom, but we need to deal with the system. And this is where we have to get. Where we stop messing with the symptoms and we start dealing with the systems that allow that thing to happen. In other words, some of you are dealing with your emotions, but you need to deal with the environment that keeps putting you in your emotions. We need to stop dealing with uh, uh, the relationships that we're hopping from and deal with the root that's causing the relationships to manifest. Stop dealing with the symptoms and start dealing with the system. He says, ma'am, you, you don't need another prescription. Either you need an evacuation or you need a demolition. In other words, if you need to get away from the environment that's making you sick, or you need to deal with what's in the environment. We have to get our fight up. Because some of us have been fighting for years. A losing battle. Because we're fighting the symptom. But we're not fighting the system that allows the symptom to manifest. And so some of us pastors got to go through our churches. And start reworking and fighting this system. Some of us inherited systems. Some of us created systems. But we have to re-examine these systems that allow church hurt to be a thing. 
That, that allows abuse to be a thing. That allows gossip to be a thing. That allows backbiting to be a thing. Some of us have to go in our workplaces, and the reason God is propelling you to be a supervisor or a manager is because he wants you to destroy that system because there are things that are happening in your office that should not be happening, but the environment needs to be shifted. He's not calling you to be a thermometer in this season. He's calling you to be a thermostat. Don't just go in there and gauge the temperature. No, baby, go in there and change the temperature. She says, I'm tired of fighting the symptoms. I need to fight the system that's allowing me to remain sick. I watch that. I need to fight the system that's profiting off of my sickness. It's funny to me that this woman doesn't have a name. We're known by her need. And some people will never acknowledge your name because they need you to have that need. Because as long as you have that need, uh, uh, they have a reason and a purpose to be around. Because everyone's profiting off of your issue but you. We gotta get fed up. Not only do we have to get fed up, we gotta get our fight up. Not only do we need to get our fight up, but we have to get our faith up. If I was to give you one more step, we, we gotta get fed up. And after we get fed up, we gotta get our fight up. And after we get our fight up, we gotta get our faith up. What do I mean? Uh, the Bible says, and this is the part where we like to get happy and we shout and we run around the church, but we really don't know why we're running around the church. So I'm gonna break this thing down. Uh, we must get our faith up. She said, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll get well. Now we're shouting because that just is it's cinematic. It's just like a movie. And we can see ourselves there. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I done fought through the bleeding, I done fought through the crowd, and, and now if I can just get down, it's, again, you can just literally see it as, as, as Mark and Luke and Matthew are painting this picture of this scene that, of this woman on her hands and knees fighting through everything. We like to see ourselves there because we feel like all our lives we had to fight. And so we identify with this moment. She's crawling, and if she can just get the hem of his garment, and, and we break out into a praise and we hit the key on the organ because that's all we need but we don't understand the moment. We gotta understand the moment. And if we understand the moment, we can actually experience the same transformation that she experienced. Because many of us have heard this sermon 20 times and we shout but we still in bondage. But it's because we don't understand the moment. Can I help you? She said, if I can just touch the hem of his clothes, I'll get well. And her bleeding stopped immediately. She felt cured from her illness. Now, why does she want to touch the hem of his garment? Why is it that she wants to touch his clothes? Now, I'm sure what she's been hearing is that Jesus of Nazareth has been walking around laying his hands on people. So if that's the case, why, why is she trying to do something different? Why would she not try to get in front of Jesus? The Bible says she comes behind. Why would she not try to get in front of Jesus and have him lay his hands on her? Because again, the word that would have come across to her is that he's been walking around, don't miss this, he's been walking around laying his hands on the blind and giving them their sight back. Laying the hands on the lame and they're getting up and they're walking. Laying his hands on those who are confused or demon possessed and the demons are going and they're becoming unfused, they're getting their clarity. He's been laying his hands, but why would she not get in front of him to have him lay his hands on her? She comes behind him through the crowd to touch his clothes. Now, she doesn't even want to touch his skin. She says, I want to touch your clothes. Well, it's because she's conflicted. She's conflicted. She's between the law and her deliverance. What do I mean? The law says, whatever I touch becomes defiled. And so she's thinking to herself, if I touch him, he'll become defiled. And so I can't touch him, I have to touch his clothes. And this is why she says, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. I don't want to defile him, uh, 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 but I believe that if I touch what's connected to him, if I can just get to what's connected to him, if I can just get to what's connected to him, then I will get my healing. It's funny, I've heard people tell stories like this. Um, me and my girlfriends would go out to the club and we would turn up and we would drink all night and go crazy. And, and, and then we would get in our car and we would put on gospel music and ask the Lord to get us home. <laughs> because in their mind, yeah. <laughs> I have to connect to something connected to God because I don't feel like I can connect to him. And so I'll turn on the gospel music after I left the club listening to track music. Because if I can just get a connection, maybe I'll be blessed. Yes, Lord. 
That might not be a testimony. You, you might have been one of these ones. Before we go to the club, uh, I would call my grandma and I would ask grandma to pray over me and my friends because we gonna go do some stuff we ain't got no business doing tonight. And, and we don't believe we can connect with God, but I know grandma got Jesus' cell phone number for real, for real. And if I can connect with grandma and, and grandma's connected to Jesus, then I can get blessed by association. The argument is, it's a weak argument, I'm going to tell you why, but the argument is that if I can just connect with what's connected to God, then I can be blessed. Now, I would say, this is an indictment on the church. Don't get me wrong, I, I, I know this is a totally separate scene, but I told you God gives me a crazy imagination, so when I see this moment of her trying to connect to what's connected to God, I see the young lady coming in our church who been turning up on Saturday night, but comes in here on Sunday morning and leaves right back out because maybe she realizes there's no connection. I wonder why this generation are slow to receive us. I think of every generation prior, and there was this reverence of the church. That, that even though I know I'm dirty, even though I know I'm messed up, I'm connecting to what's connected to God. And maybe they don't feel comfortable coming in our churches because they question the connection. They're not running to our churches anymore because they don't believe we're connected. That if I come dirty, I'm leaving dirty. If I come messed up, I'm leaving messed up. If I come bound, I'm leaving bound because I don't know if they really got a connection. The connection is questionable. So she, she, she's assessing the situation and she says, if I can just connect with what's connected to God, then maybe I can get blessed by association. The problem with that is the law says that whatever she touches, becomes defiled. Not just whoever, but whatever. So here's the thing. Uh, and and it, it paints out a picture like this in Leviticus. That if I touch what she touched, then I'll still become defiled even though I didn't touch her. Right. So her argument of if I touch his clothes, then maybe he won't get defiled because I'm touching his clothes. Well, no, the problem is if you touch his clothes, his clothes are now defiled. And because his clothes are defiled and he's wearing the clothes, he's now defiled. But I think in the back of her mind, she figured something else out. I think she figured out. I'll share this next thought. God cannot be dirtied by your dirt, bound by your bondage, or broken by your brokenness. Mm -hmm. Whew. I'm going to say that again. God cannot be dirtied by your dirt, bound by your bondage, or broken by your brokenness. I think she came to the conclusion that God is more powerful than my problem. That, 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 that if I can get to God, watch this, he can't catch what I got, but I can catch what he got. Yeah. And so this woman fights through the crowd because she's made up in her mind that, listen, I might mess all these people up behind me, but if I can touch him, it'll all be worth it. That, that, that if I can just touch the hem of his garment, it's impossible for him to catch what I have. But I can catch what he has. And might I argue that there's some people who don't want to come to church, don't want to pray to God, don't want to open their Bibles because they have this theology that we've pushed out. That God can somehow be dirty by our dirty. That you are too dirty for God to deliver. You are too messed up for God to fix. You are too broken for God to restore. That somehow what you got going on is too much for the God who created the heavens and the earth. But the same God that created the heavens and the earth is the same God that can pull me out of the hell that I found. Where can I go to escape the presence of the Lord if I sin as high as heaven? If I make my bed in hell, he's there. There's no dirt too dirty that my God can't cover me. There's no mess too messy that my God can't cover me. There's no brokenness too broke that God can't put together. And the world is concerned with messing up our God. Instead of receiving the miracle of our God. 
and they do so because we say crazy stuff like, come out from among them and be separate. And we don't understand the, the message about it. We don't understand who the audience was of that. We don't understand what God was saying. He was not saying that they can mess us up. Uh, listen, people look at me crazy when I wrap my arms around a brother that came in here in the middle of a pandemic. The reason I did that is because I'm crazy enough to believe that in that moment, because God was leading me, there was nothing that I could catch from him, but he could catch everything from me. You can't make my God dirty. You can't make my God mess. You can't break my God. But he can break your world. He can mess up your message. And he can undirty your dirt. I was watching TV. And I saw this interesting commercial. I think this will make my point. It was for a non-stick pan. Now, I've used non-stick pans before. And there are certain conditions you have to abide by with non-stick pans. But this non-stick pan, they were telling me that it didn't matter what you did to it, you can't mess it up. <clears throat> that, that, that you don't have to use a, a cooking grease with it because nothing can stick to it. That, that Watch this. What it was made of made it impossible for anything to mess it up. And in the commercial, they started putting the pan through all the tests. They started cooking without grease. They, 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 they melted cheese in it. They did all kinds of stuff you would never do to your pan because they cost too much. But, but they started doing all these things. And what I noticed is that the pan was affecting what was in it. But what was in it could never affect the pan. And this is the God I serve. That if you jump in Jesus, there's nothing you can do in him to affect him. But come unto me all that labor, and I can give you rest. If you get in me, I'll change you, but I promise you, you'll never change me. For I, the God, never change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there's no sin you have that'll cause me to stop being God. Come on. Come on. There's many people in the Bible you could model your faith at. Come on, Dale. I raised her. That, that if we could get the world on this type of faith, yes, sir. if I preach a Jesus of this type, if I tell, if I tell the world, listen, jump in Jesus. <laughs> you ain't going to change him. But I promise you, he's going to change you. Yes. And really the concern is not that they'll mess up our God. The problem is we don't want you here because you're going to mess up our system. Because you can't dirty my God, but you might dirty my system. And maybe God wants to dirty your system because you ain't getting no real work in a long time. And so he's saying roll up your sleeves and get dirty. Because the Bible says in the beginning, God said, uh, I will make man in my image after my likeness. And God does something interesting. He rolls up his sleeves and he forms man of the dirt of the ground and breathes into dirt that man might become a... And God can roll his sleeves up and get dirty. How dare we not roll our sleeves up and get dirty? Bump this system. Bump it. Because there's something wrong with a church that says you're too dirty, you're too messy, you're too broken. Because if we'll be honest, we've all been dirty, we've all been messy, and we've all been broken. She gets her faith up, and I would argue she has more faith than some of us. And because of the level of her faith, she doesn't get a next week blessing. She doesn't get a next month blessing. She doesn't get a next year blessing. She gets an immediate blessing. Because she's made up in her mind that if I jump in Jesus, something will happen. You can't touch me. Come on now. 
We must get fed up. We must get our fight up. We must get our faith up. I know I told you three. Can I give you one more? Well, I'm here, you know. I might as well. Right. Yeah, right. What, what, what is my time? I'm looking. I, I got 15 minutes. Uh, 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 we must get fed up. We must get our fight up. We must get our faith up. I'm crazy enough to believe that if we do, if we do those three things, uh-huh. God will get your faith right. Come on! I, I know, I know, on, I know, I know. I, the Baptists say I only get three points, but I couldn't help but miss this last one. It was there. It, it was there. It was there. Can I, can, can, I, can I show you in the Bible what I mean? Because the first three were things that she had to do, but, but then God does something. Uh, verse 30 says, at that moment, Jesus felt power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and he asked a question. He said, who touched my clothes? Uh-huh. His disciple. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Does, does God feel power leave him when you pray? Oh, my God. I know. I, listen, don't blame me on the Holy Ghost. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. Does he feel power leave him when you pray? And maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's the problem, that when we pray, no power is pulled from him because we don't actually believe what we're praying. My God. Call me crazy. 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 crazy. But, 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 but does he feel power when you pray? God bless you, my brother. Does he feel power when you pray? Does he feel power when you pray? His disciples said unto him, how, how can you ask to touch me when you see the crowd pressing you on all sides? But he kept looking around to see the woman who had done it. Jesus said, listen, I know somebody touched me. The woman trembled with fear. Now the reason she's fearing is because she broke the law to get her miracle. She broke the law. She broke the rules to get her miracle. And Jesus told her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be cured from your illness. Can I I work on this a little bit? I told you, at the beginning of this sermon, we're introduced to her as the woman with the issue of blood. She has no name. Now, theologians believe that when, when a person in the Bible doesn't have a name, that it's an invitation for us to put ourselves in their shoes. Uh-huh. In, in, in essence, I can say I am her because she has no name. It's an invitation for me to jump in her shoes. Now, that's going to bless you in a moment. But the other reason she doesn't have a name is because society has, has identified her by her issue. Uh, in other words, her issue was more profitable than her identity. And so because we can profit off of her issue, I don't need her to know who she is. I just need her to know what's wrong with her. She has no name. She has no name. But then Jesus asked a question. She had got her healing already. She good. She ain't got to do nothing else. She can just scoot right on back through the crowd. But Jesus asked a question. He says, who touched me? And the Bible says she's scared. She's uncomfortable. Because she's worried about what are these people going to do to me? Because they know I broke the rules. She's worried about them. But in spite of the fear, the Bible says, and this this is what my translation says, she got up and she told the whole truth. Which means she, she confessed, I had an issue. In fact, I had an issue that y'all told me I couldn't be here. I had an issue so bad that that I haven't seen my family in 12 years. I got an issue so bad, I ain't been to church in 12 years. I got an issue so bad that y'all been talking about me for 12 years. I got an issue so bad that y'all done gave up on me. I got an issue so bad that I had to talk to myself because none of y'all would talk to me. I had to tell myself if I could touch the hem of his garment because y'all told me to give up and die. I had an issue for 12 years. But I was crazy enough to believe that if I could just touch. Listen, you ain't got to touch me. If I can just touch you, then I'll be made whole. Come on. Yes, sir. Yes, she sir. gets up, and because she opens her mouth, this woman who has no name, watch this, 
she becomes something new. Search through the Bible. This is the only time you see Jesus refer to someone as daughter. You won't find it anywhere else. So this woman who has no name now becomes new in front of everybody. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away before all things. In other words, she gets an upgrade. Yes. Can I make a point? Um, I love renting cars because I don't like to put a whole lot of miles on my own car. So if I go out of town and I go somewhere, I rent a car. In fact, I rent so many cars that, that I have like an exclusive membership with one of the car rental places. They know me by name. I can skip the line. It's beautiful. I get points that can add up to free rentals. It's an amazing thing. One time I went to go get a rental and uh, I got my rental. I went to pick my wife up. My wife uh, hopped in the car and she said, honey, this is unacceptable. She started looking around and she realized it wasn't as clean as our cars normally are. It, it, things weren't looking right to her. It looks like they essentially took one person out of the car and put us in the car. She said, honey, this is unacceptable. We have to say something. I said, okay, honey, we'll call them up and let them know. So she calls up the rental car place and says, listen, uh, my, my husband came up there and he got this car, but it is unacceptable. And he said, well, listen, if you have time, come back. We want to do something. So sure enough, we were running a little late, but we went to the car rental place, let them know, hey, we're the ones that call. What's up? They said, listen, um, we take our name very serious. We, we, we don't just put our name on anything. And so because you said something, I know you rented this car. But what we want to do because of your experience, we want to upgrade you to this model. See, this model costs this much more, but because our name is on the line, we don't care how much it costs. We don't care what you pay because of your experience. We want to make sure we turn it around. Can I argue on today? That if you would just open up your mouth, if, if, if you would just testify from time to time about how good God is doing, that, 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 that maybe, just because his name is on the line, that God might do something for you yeah. that you never saw coming. She becomes the only woman in the entire Bible that Jesus calls daughter. And some of you, that might not be your testimony, but there are things that God did for you and only you. Yeah. Not because he's an unfair God, not because he's an unjust God, but it was just for you. But only because you were willing to open your mouth. They said, listen, our name's on the line. And because my name's on the line, I can't let you go out like that. And Jesus, in the midst of these people, he says, I know y'all know how dirty she was. I know y'all know how messed up she was. I know y'all know how broken she was. You don't know her name, but that's my daughter. And I don't know about you, but the life I've lived, things I've been through, things I've seen, things I've experienced, I'm so glad that some folks never really knew my name, but they watched me become new. See, I tell folks sometimes some of the things I've been through and some of the experiences that I've had, and they say, Pastor Mike, I can't believe that because you don't look like it. See, the problem is, I'm not riding in what I was riding in. God gave me an upgrade. The, the Mike Goodman you see today ain't the Mike Goodman that used to be. But because I jumped in Jesus, he made me new. He did something for me that he could only do for me. If you want to go from bleeding to blessing, if you're tired of bleeding, you have to get fed up. And once you get fed up, you got to get your fight up. And once you get your fight up, get your faith up. And if you do all three of those things, I promise you, God will get your favor up. That he'll do things for you.
that your eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the imagination the things that he has for those who love him. Somebody say, God, upgrade me. God, upgrade me. I've been leaving a long time. I need to upgrade. Oh, and that's what happens in this text. <clears throat> and the words of Fanny Lou Hamer, this sister simply says, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And until you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you will continue bleeding and you will normalize the bleeding and find yourself 12 years later trying to figure out what happened. Okay. One of the most dangerous things is when uncomfortable becomes comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And many of us have been uncomfortable yeah. for so long Jesus. that we just decided that maybe my life is just meant to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we normalize what's abnormal, not because we have to, but because we just don't know what to do. 